Namaskar, I'm Professor Devdi Purkaista from the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. Welcome to my course, Business Fundamental for Entrepreneurs, Part 1, Internal Operation. As part of my course, I'm very happy to welcome Mr. Ashok Balasubramanian and Mr. K. Karthikyan from Open Weaver to share a case study about Open Weaver. Mr. Ashok is the founder and CEO of Open Weaver. He has a long industry experience in various companies, and before joining Open Weaver, he worked in a global company called Atos as the global CTO of the business and platform solution division. Mr. Karthiken has an equally illustrious history in corporate. And before founding Open Viva, he was the director automation at Sintel Atos. With this, I have the pleasure of handing over to Mr. Ashok and Mr. Karthiken for their module. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Ashok Balasubramanian. Uh, I'm co founder and CEO at Open Viva. Uh, I have about 23 years of experience in uh, digital technologies. I've uh, worked across uh, all areas from mainframes to uh, open systems, uh, cloud, AI, automation, so on and so forth. Uh, worked across uh, different global corporations and different geographies. Very passionate about you know, uh, how uh, these emerging technologies uh, help uh, our lives and, and help optimize businesses. Uh, have about uh, uh, three patents in the uh, in the cloud and AI area, uh, and and we're very uh, thankful to Professor Dev Deep and N. Petal uh, for uh, giving us this forum to share our uh, experience with you all. Uh, uh, hope you find this uh, our learnings useful, uh, and over to you, Karthik. Hello, all. My name is Karthik N. I am the CTO at Open Weaver. I have about 23 plus years of experience in the IT industry. Mainly, my, most of my experience has been on the technology side in the application development, product design and development, research and development, on different areas across multiple technologies of uh, enterprise AI, enterprise integration, as well as uh, solution design. I have been mainly working on automation and AI earlier, and with OpenViewer, we started out to build the uh, multiple set of uh, products based on open source uh, platforms. Back to you, Ashok. Thanks, Karthik. Uh, so, I, I, kind of, you know, uh, it's a, uh, a great topic for me to be talking about. Uh, so, the topic that we'll talk about today is uh, uh, the art and science of uh, new product development. Uh, it's something that's very uh, close to us. Uh, so, if you look at it, uh, we ourselves are a, a three-year-old startup. Uh, we started with a vision to change the way uh, the world builds digital. Uh, and in these three years, we created uh, multiple products uh, within our platforms. Uh, and today, we support about uh, 4 million uh, users on our platform. Uh, and we're very grateful that we won uh, NASCOM SME Inspire Award for uh, outstanding customer experience. Uh, we are also a 2022 uh, Economic Times Best Tech Brand. Uh, and as we scale our operations, we also are a, a great place to work certified organization. So it's a it's a great set of uh, learnings that we look forward to sharing in terms of you know, how we started up, how we built our products. Uh, but what makes it much more exciting is, is our core mission of existence is around accelerating digital. Uh, and that will bring in a lot more learnings, a lot more accelerators that we would love to share with you all in terms of you know, how could you accelerate uh, your new product development. So through, through these, uh, uh, the way we share uh, our learnings, uh, we'll be referring to uh, Professor Dev Deep's uh, innovation model, uh, so that it adds a, a structure to how we are sharing, and, and it helps kind of you know for you to refer uh, how you kind of went through the course and, and how these learnings uh, fall into place. So the first uh, amazing learning uh, from uh, my perspective is you know you need to be part of the problem. 
So it might sound uh, counterintuitive because we are always told saying, hey, don't be part of the problem. Uh, but for you to uh, kind of successfully uh, start a startup and of course uh, take it all the way, uh, you should have gone through the pain. Uh, so you should have gone through the pain, uh, you should have looked for solutions, you should have spoken to people who are trying to solve the same problem. Uh, you shouldn't have found a solution and then you created certain ideas that uh, help you do it. So that part is extremely critical because uh, it's a long journey for you to start up and scale. Uh, and, and something like this that uh, you're so passionate to solve the problem only comes from uh, deeply, deeply being part of the problem. So you, you take it for our case, right? So we worked many, many years in the technology space. We created a lot of amazing solutions. We made a lot of revenues. Uh, but those were from a context, from a, a enterprise a software perspective, uh, great, right? So there were a lot of good technical solutions. But over the last few years, what you're seeing uh, is, is and, and you all would have seen as well in, in day to day life, right? So uh, digital is disintermediating every business. So the way you buy your grocery, uh, the way you book your cab, the way you buy tickets, the way you bank today uh, are, are completely disintermediated. So now that's something very similar is happening in the technology space as well. So in the legacy model, uh, you had large corporates that came up with ideas. They said, hey, we want to create a platform. And then we had large service providers who would recruit a lot of people, train them, and, and build these solutions over many, many years. So that is what we have seen as IT or technology for the past you know, many decades. So now what's happening? You have hundreds of thousands of startups, uh, young, young uh, professionals who are creating amazing ideas. And you have billions of users across the globe uh, kind of using these platforms. So this is what I call as, you know, uh, the whole digital has disintermediated itself, the way digital is being created. And it has also democratized, which means everyone today is a developer, everyone today is a digital consumer. So the ways of, of building digital in this new disintermediated and democratized world uh, needs to change significantly. We cannot say, hey, you know, we will do a contract for eight months, two years, we will get a few hundred people. That model is gone. So we need a new model. Uh, and that was the mission for us to found OpenWeaver. And, and that's the path that we are on today. So extremely important. Uh, you need to be part of the problem, feel deeply about changing it. Uh, next part of it, uh, this you might have had a vague idea, right, on, on what my solution is, uh, what am I trying to solve. Uh, but very important for you to take the next set of steps. So you need to look at it and say, hey, this is my idea. Uh, but this idea comprises of, of maybe 10, 12 blocks. Uh, and how do these blocks broadly look like? And, and what exists in the market today? What does not exist? Uh, what does a competition look like? Uh, and, and very important as you kind of have a, a core founding team to see if you can balance it with uh, slightly contrasting uh, team members. So you can bring in different ideas and very important to play the devil's advocate that says, hey, uh, why would someone buy this from us or why is my idea really unique or why is this building block really required? A and if, you're, if you can, I, I think uh, enlist some amazing mentors who can actually give you that critical feedback as well. In our case, uh, we had that uh, vague idea that says, hey, uh, we need to change the way the world builds digital in this uh, democratized manner. But then we said, hey, how, how is that possible? Because there are so many levers at play today. You had Agile, you had Cloud, you had AI, you have uh, open source, you have reuse, you have low code, no code, open architectures, blah, blah, blah. You have so many different things in place. So it really became for us to say, hey, we will use block A, block B, block C. Why is this unique? Uh, and then you know, make sure that we really understood the, the enormity, the complexity of how all these things come together. So very important for you to get that clarity on, on what is that uh, journey that you are potentially going to take. right? So this is still within yourself. So within your founding team, uh, hopefully with a set of uh, uh, neutral mentors who can help you understand it. Uh, next uh, critical step is for you to understand that with a, a set of uh, potential pilot customers who can actually look at it and say, hey, uh, is this something that they would use? And very important for you to know saying who your potential set of pilot users would be. Uh, because remember the first step, you were part of a problem, you spoke to a lot of people who had that problem and, and you all were trying to solve it. So you need to go back to that route and say, hey, who are these people uh, who are looking for the same set of solutions? 
uh, very important to kind of you know understand their user journey uh, and and look at where does your solution fit in uh, which steps of the problem does it solve uh, again is it going to be sticky uh, because that's very critical for them saying it needs to be sticky otherwise uh, your product might not ha not have returning users and the next step saying is someone going to pay for it uh, so uh, if you have a solution that broadly is in an existing market you may have a uh, a rough competition landscape so you might be able to say you know what are their their revenues like what are their pricing models like so you'll get an idea but many many a scenarios uh, we entrepreneurs build something that does not exist today so they're going back to this user journey uh, what steps do we solve uh, what is the value that is generated how sticky is it what is the frequency of use what is the value that they perceive it is not the value that you perceive it is the value that the user perceives and hence uh, what could they pay for you uh, or for your platform is is something that is critical so uh, so we kind of uh, created a, a a rough idea we detailed the concept we played devil's advocate we got some sort of an idea in terms of you know what uh, a customer might get value from it so next step uh, of the strategic advantage is very very critical because uh, as in any startup uh, i think the the most scarce resources are bandwidth right so we all go through issues right from you know uh, hr insurance recruitment uh, what is a pf policy uh, what is an rbi uh, you know what uh, statutory requirements do you need to comply to so on and so forth so your time is probably the the toughest uh, thing that you have on your side so very important for you to understand what is strategic advantage to you uh, and there again uh, you know very critical for you to have it as a as a web of strategic advantages versus two three different points of differentiation so now once you identify your strategic advantage you need to say if there are 20 blocks like we said for us right so we had no code low code ai uh, algorithms uh, reusability open source then you really have to pick and choose saying hey uh, you are going to deeply specialize in in 1 2 3 uh, and then maybe the remaining 17 are something that you will reuse from the market so that will kind of help you understand it deeply right so you will say in these three you will invest deeply you will build core competencies there you will take your time to build that deep and differentiated and sticky with the user remaining our our time to market you know how fast can you reuse it how fast can you model it towards your customer's journey uh, will make you run at a, a very fast pace while creating a, a very uniquely differentiated product and and very important uh, critical for you to make sure that you protect that core ip uh, so patenting is very critical of course it's a large topic on its own but please plan for that plan for uh, making sure you have patents in place you have a pipeline of patents uh, even for solutions that you will uh, uh, deploy maybe one year two years down the line because uh, that uh, will kind of help you scale so our case we have about uh, 18 patents filed and, and many many more in the pipeline so very critical uh, so till now we were more uh, inward focused and we had a little bit of those pilot users telling you know wh what value it adds to them uh, then comes this critical part of you know what is your addressable market uh, and and as we all create saas solutions uh, scale is the game right digital uh, is is synonymous with scale so you didn't really need to understand saying because all of us are are proud of our baby so we say our solutions is great uh, you might have talked to some people who said it's great but uh, can that greatness scale you know that's very important so you really need to spend time to understand what is your total addressable market is it hundreds of millions is it tens of millions millions hundreds of thousands uh, what is the scale that you're looking at because uh, at some point earlier we said hey what is a rough price point that you have so that price point plus you know the scale will give you an idea in terms of you know how your uh, company will scale in the marketplace uh, of course as a total addressable market it always is, is boiling the ocean right so you have hopefully uh, a very large uh, ocean of a marketplace for you uh, but ocean is difficult to navigate for a small startup so that's where the segmentation comes in so you really need to look at it and say hey can i slice it uh, based on many levers so for example our scenario right so we are a tech platform so the most simplistic we could slice it by technology java developers python developers no code developers so on and so forth so and, and we said that so first one we said uh, total addressable market for just the tech developers is about 50 million people globally uh, and the citizen developer is about 200 million people globally 
in that we could have slice saying you know the tech is python java javascript blah 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 you know maybe 20 large languages that are there uh, no code could be you know maybe a hr function back office function uh, maybe some domains like insurance or retail or healthcare so you could slice it uh, any any different ways uh, and and you could slice it maybe based on geography you could slice it based on you know maybe the the way of working of people maybe are they a independent developer are they in a, a very large controlled enterprise scenario yeah, you could do it based on are they juniors or are they mid level are they senior developers so you could so there are many many ways uh, that are available for you to segment uh, very important for you to understand the personas because you created a product with an idea that you know this is the value chain and this value chain it adds value so make sure you pick personas related to it don't go after a market that does not reflect on uh, the value that you defined earlier in the part so for us we did of course look at all those parts but we said the most simplistic one let's look at uh, can we start uh, you know where is the accessibility for us because right so we are a startup uh, and for a startup uh, the investments bandwidth on the sales side is limited so we can't go and, and spend uh, many months chasing one enterprise customer and then you know maybe get few licenses out of it so we said let's use accessibility as a as a critical uh, criteria so let's say who are the people who are willing to try a product uh, and may not have that uh, constraint of getting maybe 10 levels of approval before using our new technology so then we said hey let's go after independent developers let's go after you know people who are graduating and getting into the development industry let's go after freelancers uh, because these are the people who are trying to do new things uh, who really want to show off new things and and these people are not constrained by you know maybe a, a security officer or or someone else who will tell them hey don't do something new so so very important for you to get such slices in place and then decide saying hey how what is more accessible to you what reflects that persona and so on and so forth so this is probably the the most uh, important uh, intersection i would call it right so we looked at it we said hey i have a amazing idea someone validated it some customers really liked it maybe they will pay for it uh, i have a market size of 100 million users that i can scale to phenomenal right uh, but how will you go through that journey there are multiple ways right you can build something and then wait for uh, those slices to pick it up uh, but technology does not wait and, and digital you know the whole disruption happens every minute uh, as we speak so very important for you to find out how do you navigate that path uh, and this slicing has helped us significantly and we hope it will help you as well. So what we found is uh, this intersection. So you, we talked about the different market segments. Uh, say your 100 million users are in, uh, you could slice them on maybe five different dimensions and have those micro markets. And this side you had your capabilities. You said there are 20 features. You could group them in many different ways. You're going to deep dive into maybe three, four, five features which are critical to you. So now marry the two. Say, hey, here is an amazing market that is accessible to me. I can maybe uh, reach out to a few hundred thousand users tomorrow. Uh, and, and they have no constraint in trying my product. And this is a feature that they may like or which may add value to this persona. So start with those intersections of, of features and, and uh, customer segments. Uh, and then you keep adding them. So the idea is that you know you have those multiple combinations and, and then all of them, you know, uh, not just sum of parts, but the whole is, is larger than the sum, that becomes your roadmap. So very critical for you to uh, kind of make sure that you have those graduated steps and, and create that roadmap that way. And, and while you do that, right, uh, so these customers who are there, they're not saying, hey, Ashok, I'm waiting for you to create an idea. So they're not, and, and everyone is busy with their problems. Uh, everyone is searching for solutions in their own ways and, and last thing that they want is to change the way they do things. So very important that we have seen uh, is meet the customer where they are, which means uh, you, have an, uh, you have an amazing vision and customer has their problems or the user has their problems. They're not going to come and say, hey, uh, Ashok, we want to listen to your you know, vision and then follow you. Of course, uh, uh, once in a blue moon you have a Steve Jobs who does it, but... Uh, but for the remaining of us, uh, it doesn't happen that way. So think of it saying, hey, what is the customer doing today? And can you create an incremental change for them, given that uh, everyone's uh, bandwidth uh, and, and uh, 
you know, time is limited, can you just give them an incremental change in the way they're doing things? So for example, for us, the first step was if people are building applications in Python, we just introduced reusability into it and said, hey, add this step to the way you're doing things and you will see a, a step change in what you're doing. So think of it that way, that uh, meet customer where they are and, and give them incremental value and then take them through change one, two, three, four, uh, and, and hopefully with that combination of changes, you will take them to a better place. And, and why is it also important of, of this slicing concept? The market is not static. Maybe uh, between uh, us starting this session and ending this session, there probably will be 10 more generative AI models that will come in. Uh, Apple launched uh, spatial computing. So new technologies will come. So your, uh, your features and technologies that you had on this side is changing. And your addressable market, maybe customers will say, no, no, I, I need generative AI, I don't need uh, legacy AI, you know. So all those things will come. So market is going to be uh, very dynamic as you go through as well. So this whole idea of slicing and, and combining will give you that flexibility that says maybe you had something else in step two, you could say, hey, now this is generative AI and I take that to customers. So very important. And also very important for you to acknowledge that and uh, some things will fail. It is important that some things fail because that's when you know that you're doing something new. And uh, each of these slices uh, that we talked about, right? so you're going to do multiple features with each of these micro markets, they themselves will present almost like a product innovation cycle for you. So plan for it, uh, make sure that you deploy to a micro market, that becomes successful, then you add, then it becomes successful. It almost becomes like a, a beautiful virtuous cycle in which each one builds on top of the other, thereby, you know, uh, kind of aligning with your product roadmap and also aligning a, a very strong uh, customer success for you. So uh, very important things uh, that we found uh, very useful. Uh, next two areas, uh, you know, we'll talk about uh, proof of concept and uh, uh, prototyping and minimum viable product. So these are uh, very important and uh, uh, we'll do a deep dive in each of these things. And the way we look at proof of concept essentially is that, you know, you have an idea, uh, there are many critical building blocks, many algorithms, security, so on and so forth involved in, in your uh, digital solution. You need to know if that uh, your understanding that you know I'll create a new algorithm which is going to change the world, uh, is that even feasible, right? Because you cannot create a two-year roadmap and then realize in the second year that, that base premise that you had that certain algorithm will change the way the business is done uh, does not uh, work that way or, you know, cannot work that way. So that would be bad to happen. So very important for you, think of proof of concepts as, as technical proof of concepts that you can test out maybe even if they are one year, two years, three years down the line for uh, your product. But make sure that you make sure that, you know, all those components that you thought of your roadmap really work. They don't need to work at your end state, but you need to know it is possible. So. Uh, Proof of concept is critical that way, and prototyping is more for you to get customer feedback. So maybe the way uh, I personally correlate, right? So I look at proof of concept as uh, digital technologies support your platform or digital technologies support your product, right? So technology supports your product is what I call as proof of concept. The whole concept of prototyping and minimum viable product is for you to see, does the market uh, kind of react to your product? So you could call it does the market support your product? So prototyping is, does the market support your product? Proof of concept is, does the technology support your product? So slightly distinct, uh, but very critical to do. And, and this is where we spent, you know, a uh, lot of hours, a lot of, lot of, you know, uh, so many man hours and so many of our patents in this area. Uh, so I'll, I'll call upon uh, Karthik to kind of, you know, deep dive, you know, uh, on, on what it looks to technically to create a product uh, what what are the stumbling blocks that will come and, and how can you be very successful in both in a POC and a, uh, and a minimum viable product perspective. Uh, so over to you, Karthik. Thank you, Ashok. I wanted to talk more about uh, giving an idea of how to go about building this proof of concept. This proof of concept is a very important step in the journey for building any startup uh, on which is based on the technical SaaS type of products. Proof of concept is uh, somewhat, uh, you know, to satisfy yourself if the technology exists to build out your ideas, to realize your ideas. Hence, it's an important step for us to do this validation 
before we embark on any kind of larger uh, development activities. So this proof of concept uh, is based on uh, uh, ensuring that technology is able to deliver what your ideas are uh, hoping to build. At the same time, these technologies can span across uh, multiple uh, dimensions of uh, AI, uh, you know, uh, big data, uh, machine learning, could be anything of that sort, but it's important for us to do a quick validation to satisfy ourselves that uh, there is technology can be used to deliver whatever we are trying to build. On some of these aspects, uh, it is, uh, you know, uh, for us to have quick results, we need to go through a cycle of uh, reuse, which is the most uh, uh, easiest way for us to ensure that we have a working uh, uh, technology demonstration of our idea. And as all you know, open source is the largest uh, ecosystem that is available for us to find those reusables. So I'll walk you through some of these examples where we can find and how we can actually make use of this uh, reusable components to do a quick uh, POC and be satisfied that uh, I am able to understand this technology, I am able to uh, assemble this technology into a working prototype, which will actually eventually lead me to building my MVP as well. So when we talk about uh, doing a quick POC, as I mentioned earlier, these technologies can be as varied from AI, could be big data, could be IoT, could be augmented reality, virtual reality, to name a few, right? But there are at least 20 such hot uh, technologies that are prevalent at any point in time. And for us to do a research and development on all these topics is going to take a lot of time. Hence, the best way, easiest way is to find reusables in the open source ecosystem, which will allow us to fast track our demonstration of this POC and validate our idea. So some of this open source reusables come in different uh, forms. Right? I mean, you will have a uh, the most basic components as core snippets. You will also have libraries. You can also have frameworks and also have something like a fully built out solution for you to assemble your working of POCs. So we have Candy here, which is like a gateway for finding all these reusable components, right? So it has a very uh, powerful natural language based search engine, which you can use to find this uh, reusable solutions that are there. And as I said earlier, these reusable solutions can be compartmentalized into three different types. So one code snippets, the other are libraries. The third thing which encompasses making use of all these libraries and code snippets into working solutions. So in Candy, you can see all three of them which is available. So you have access to a code snippets which allow you to build your custom functions. If you're trying to build something like a uh, maybe a passwordless uh, authentication framework in the area of security, you can search for that. And you will also have fully you know, developed kits that are available to reuse with one click install, which you can use to as a base for building your own uh, solution. So something on, for example, you could have a chatbot, you could have a, a deep learning framework that is used to do an object detection. So all of the sort of solutions are available as uh, one click kits which you can use to make your you know solutions as a base uh, for this building your solutions so i'll use some of these examples and then show you how you can be able to find these assets as well So assume that you wanted to do something in the area of a passwordless authentication frameworks, which instead of you know having someone to remember their passwords, you go about uh, removing all those uh, different constraints. So you can come here and then search for reusable components which are catering to this particular uh, functionality. So you, as I said earlier, you will have uh, code snippets, you will have libraries, you will have also fully built out kits, right? So when it comes to libraries, for example, something that is there on the React, which is React framework, which is on the UI. So how you can actually implement passwordless on the React framework or Next.js framework is there are a bunch of libraries that gets displayed here. These are all again curated uh, based on uh, different parameters that 
goes into defining their quality, their security, their usability and ranked accordingly. That way you have the best libraries uh, uh, given to you in your search results which you can use to build out your solution. Likewise, there are fully built kits also. For example, if you want to do something um, on let us say uh, some kind of you know new encryption that you want to do. So you can search for encryption libraries in JavaScript to do something on the front end side. And if you look at there are a bunch of uh, good popular libraries that are listed which you can use. At the same time, if you scroll down below, you can also look at the different kind of kits that are available with them for different solutions. For example, if you want to do uh, uh, understand what kind of you know popular libraries are available in the JavaScript language, you can use any of this guide list and then understand what are the different libraries that are available for doing or implementing encryptions, right? So it gives a jump start for you to analyze what is the spread of such reusable libraries in the open source world. You can choose them based on the different dimensions on uh, popularity, quality, as well as uh, you know uh, the different license type as well. The permissive ones allow you to reuse them in your commercial applications as well. The last uh, type of solution that you could also search is uh, you know for you to have fully built out kits which comes with a one, kit, one click installer which you can use as a base to fast track your application development. For example, if you wanted to do something on uh, uh, a federated uh, risk management based on machine learning, you can search for that. So this is one such example where one of our uh, startup uh, partners were trying to build out a solution and uh, they had used this particular kit to fast track building out a POC to showcase how a federated machine learning could be utilized in a distributed way to secure access to uh, data which is shared ac across different you know. Uh, uh, providers. So, for example, in this case, let us say you want to build a credit risk predictor using this model where different uh, players such as the banking institutions participate in the overall learning, but they do not share the data. So, they keep the data to themselves that way the security is built. So, this particular kit has a fully built out uh, kit which you can download and install. It will have different libraries which are uh, stitched together to give you this solution. So there are a bunch of libraries with respect to machine learning, with respect to giving the overall framework from a federated learning where there is a concept of a client and server model that is, work, that is working here. So to summarize back, uh, building out a POC is for us to satisfy that the technology exists to solve the problem and the best way to do is that, you know, make use of, make reuse of all these open source components and reuse components uh, you can have accessed in the form of code snippets, libraries as well as fully built uh, solution kits which you can download and install. One of the other solution that I also wanted to talk about was giving an example of how we can use a generative AI as a solution as well. Yeah, so today it's almost impossible to miss this generative AI. This generative AI is becoming all pervasive and one of the use cases, uh, for example, is to use this to generate uh, images as well, right? So you can 
give a brief description uh, of what you want, what you are looking for and the machine will generate images. Since these images could be anything, it could be uh, from generating a background for your uh, you know, digital website, could be something else that you want to create a persona as well. So this is one of the kits that we have created which is using a voice to image uh, generator using multiple technologies. So one of it is to convert your voice to text and then from that text you also generate a image using the generative AI technology. So this kit is also available as a one click solution for you to install and then check it out. So only in this case is that these are uh, kits which are slightly technical in nature for you to actually download, play around and then execute, implement it, run it and then see how it performs and whether your idea is getting uh, implemented or you using this particular libraries or this technologies. Okay? But going uh, more than this POC is the next step where we want to do a full fledged prototype. Yeah, so now we have looked at you know, how to go about building the POC but then moving on to the next step where we want to do a real prototype. Okay? And prototype is slightly a different game altogether. Prototype is to ensure that uh, whatever ideas that we have are being able to be successfully communicated to the end user in, in a minimal viable product uh, view. Right? So we want to build out a full uh, view of that product which users can actually touch and feel they understand the idea better. And this involves actually going more than whatever we did in the POC. So we need a lot of other components, lot of other layers to build out this prototype. So typically in a SaaS product, you will require a fully fledged uh, digital website which conveys your idea, which actually has the different services to deliver the functionality that you had originally imagined. Uh, for the end user. So there is definitely a, a landing page which describes what your product is all about. You will have a product page which lists the features that are available in your product. You will have multiple other such elements which is including your core services. You will have other elements like uh, uh, which are uh, typically required in a SaaS product. For example, you will need a lot of authentication, membership management, you will require uh, user management, you will require subscription management, you will also require payment integration. So likewise, there are a whole host of uh, components that are required to build out this prototype apart from your core idea, core technology idea that you wanted to implement. So all of this uh, going together in hand in hand is actually slightly daunting because there are multiple technologies at play here. You will have uh, front-end technologies which varies from different JavaScript frameworks which are like uh, React, Vue, anything of that sort in today's world. But at the same time, you will also have a good uh, complex uh, middleware logic that is also built. You will also require a lot of backend uh, services starting right from databases to integrating multiple services, could be AI services, could be integration services across different third-party services. So like this, you will require end-to-end uh, a -end, uh, full stack starting from your front end to your back end. You will also require a lot of uh, uh, deployment related strategies that way that you will have your application deployed into a environment which is uh, scalable at the same time very much reliable 24 bar 7. So in the earlier days when we wanted to build out such a solution, we used to have to do uh, R&D on what kind of solution that we, solution architecture that we will have to build and then what is the technical architecture we will have to uh, create. We will have to assemble all these products, uh, do a quick POC and then really build out this product which could take anywhere between uh, uh, many weeks to you know uh, like a 3-4 month cycle for us to get a minimum viable product. But uh, today we have Studio which is like a no code platform which will allow you to quickly create this uh, MVP uh, without having to worry about such complexities about technologies and architecture. So I'll go and show how we can do this uh, in studio, how to quickly create your prototype and then get to a stage where you are able to deploy it uh, for a customer who can really experience it and then give you that feedback as well. Yeah, so this is the OpenViewer Studio and I have logged into studio and what you are seeing on the screen is the workspace. So workspace is your like personal workspace where you assemble 
logical units of your applications and is easier for you to manage what are applications that you create. And when we get to creating an application, uh, there are two ways to go about it. So one, you might already have a, a already built out template for you to use when you create your applications. For example, you might already have an application template which is built for creating an application based on conversational services. There could be another which is based for creating an application which is using generative video and images. So likewise, there are a bunch of uh, other templates which are spread across multiple technologies as well as multiple domains as well. So you might have a e-commerce template, you might have a healthcare application, you might have a doctor appointment, you might have a general appointment management. So like that, uh, across different domains, as well as technology aspects, you will have multiple such templates for you to use. That way you will get a head start on actually creating your applications, screens, as well as the different other components that we spoke earlier about, which we can reuse and fast track the whole application development on the studio itself, right? So in the studio, <coughs> you can create from a template or you can go about uh, creating a fresh application as well, which is like a blank uh, application. So. I'll show you uh, different other aspects within the studio which, which will tell you how you can actually assemble the other layers of the applications for you to ensure that your functionality is getting uh, implemented. So earlier I explained to you how an application has different stacks. So it has a front-end stack, it has a middleware where you have most of your business logic and integrations. At the same time, you have something called as a back-end where you will have the database configured, you will have uh, different other resources for your applications to consume. And these resources could be third-party web services, could be many apps that you have actually incorporated in the form of either some machine learning models or some other services which are core to your applications. So what we see here in the studio as three different designers uh, as the design is designer, the page designer is the component which allows you to design your front end screens. Okay. And then the flow part uh, is where you actually configure all of your different business logics connecting your UI with the backend part. So you can have uh, multiple uh, uh, flows depicting what kind of business logic, what kind of integration that you want to do when any action happens on your uh, UI front end. The resources part is a third designer where you configure what kind of resources your applications are uh, requiring access to. For example, on the resources part, Some of these examples are like, you know, as I talked about earlier, the data sources could be different. So you could have your data in a simple CSV, you could have it in cloud database, you could have it in your own, uh, you know, databases as well. So these resources will allow you to integrate with those type of different data sources. Other than databases or data sources, you will also have access to this mini apps, which are fully built out solutions like the kits that we saw earlier in the candy. So these are fully built out solutions that you can integrate. If it is an AI solution, you can set up your AI related machine learning related parameters. You can configure, train them with your own data set. That way you have the backend service configured as a resource here for you to consume, for the front end to consume through the studio. You will have access to multiple functions, uh, services, functions could be AI based, non-AI based, could be third party. So all these resources typically help you to finally integrate to multiple functionalities within your applications, right? On the flow editor part, <coughs> you have access to a lot of uh, widgets to configure your uh, action flows. And these flows you will have, uh, you, you know, like a flow chart, you can define what happens one after the other. You will have options to configure different type of business conditions, business rules, integrate different services, uh, transform data. That way any action that, want, that has to happen on any interaction from the user will land here and then it can be uh, executed in a way that your business demands with uh, 
uh, options for you to customize uh, all this logic. So you have options to add custom code components. You can also integrate services. So very highly customizable, highly scalable. That way it's not that you are limited by all this blocks that you see here. There are options where you will be able to integrate the resources, your custom code, your custom functions, anything can be integrated. That way it is highly scalable for you to decide what kind of business logic that you want to implement in your application. The third designer is a page designer where you have access to <coughs> a whole set of uh, UI widgets, right? So for me to build a stunning UI, you will have access to a lot of this UI widgets, which range from uh, display widgets for you to display images, information, any kind of text, uh, logos, all of these different uh, visual elements for you to display information. You will have access to a lot of form elements to capture uh, information from the user. You will have uh, pre-built sections also for you to you know, quickly assemble your website pages without you having to actually code. So for example, this image gallery component, you can quickly drag and drop it in here, which will allow you to configure it with a set of image resources for it to display in a very gallery format. For example, you could have carousels. So like that, there are multiple other sections. There could be headers, footers. There are different sections for testimonials, contact us, a chatbot. So a typical SaaS product, a digital product, whatever it needs, all of these blocks are available for us to drag and drop, quickly assemble, configure, and use, and connect it back to the flows and services without having to code. If you have to code, there is an option for that also. That way, any kind of customization you will have access to. So apart from this, obviously, the solution that we create also has to be delivered in multiple channels. It could be on your... Uh, desktop computer, on your laptop, on your tablet, on your mobile. So there is facility built in for you to actually have a responsive website built. And these websites are also like, you know, uh, progressive web apps, which can be installed as an app on your smartphones also, right? So you have a whole host of responsiveness uh, built into this design, designing your front end. Now we have, let us say, you know, designed your entire application with the UI, with the action flows and resources. You also have options to deploy it with one click. Okay, So that way, you don't have to worry about trying to set up an environment in the cloud with your subscription and then trying to you know, deploy this application there. But just with one click, all of this entire application components that we actually configured here are uh, packaged and then deployed into the cloud environment uh, in one click. You will be able to immediately access your application. You will be able to immediately give it out uh, for getting feedback on your idea as well. So we saw all the different components that the studio provides in the form of page designer, flow designer, as well as resource designer. And uh, hopefully it helped you understand how to assemble the different layers of the applications together in a no-code manner for you to quickly build out application. I also wanted to show you a quick example of how one of our other startup uh, uh, group created one application using the studio platform. A brief uh, intro about this idea that I wanted to tell you is that, you know, typically you have this e-commerce uh, platforms uh, where you can uh, sell your products. So for example, a fashion uh, designer, uh, can you make use of a e-commerce platform to uh, sell his products? But actually, it does not give a real experience of a boutique uh, fashion designer. So if you have, let us say, some idea as a user that you wanted your uh, fashion dress to address, it is not easy for that to happen in a traditional e-commerce uh, platform. So let's see how this startup uh, created this red carpet platform uh, using a studio with uh, generative AI technologies to give a very unique boutique experience for the fashion designer based e-commerce platform. So what we see here is the workspace on the studio platform. This red carpet is the application which was designed by them. So what we see here is the UI framework. Yeah, so now let's see how the red carpet was built with studio. So the red carpet platform This is how it looks like uh, in the studio platform where it was designed. So right now we are in the flow designer part. We are in the page designer part. 
<coughs> as you can see the entire landing page of this uh, website uh, is getting configured here so there are multiple widgets as we saw earlier which is used to create this landing page so there's a background image all together with a, a search widget that is integrated here you have uh, different themes also that you can apply we made use of this image gallery as one of the widgets along with the card layout that way whatever they wanted to show as uh, suggestions uh, recommendations uh, for anyone trying to search for a particular fashion design uh, can get populated over here and this images are actually getting sourced by a flow which is configured over here on the right side if you see trending uh, collection flow so when all this page loads this particular flow gets executed which is configured in the flow designer and that will actually pull in the most trending designs uh, of this season and then show it as a uh, on the home page so this is a page where you know uh, after searching for a particular design how it is going to actually fill in with the search results or you know not search results in this case sorry it is fully generated results so as i said earlier this is a unique idea which is built out using generative ai technologies so whatever we see we are going to see as the results from the description of your fashion uh, desire is actually fully generated at real time and is not actually getting searched or retrieved from a database right so this is a generate screen so assume that the user has typed something here and then click search right at the bottom is what we see the entire generated uh, results and for this we also have integrated a flow which is called as the apparel generative flow which is again designed in your uh, flow designer in the flow designer we have integrated the resource appropriate for this generative ai technology which actually takes the text input uh, from the user and generates all these images and these images are linked back to this uh, uh, generative uh, image gallery over here again one example of those different resources so in this case this text to image is one of the resources that was configured for generating the styles so after <coughs> you know uh, choosing a particular uh, uh, generative uh, design the next step would be obviously for the user to actually order from his or her cart right so this my closet is nothing equivalent to a e-commerce cart that you see so after having uh, adding uh, your uh, desired fashion uh, you know choices to the cart this is a page which can be used to check out right so you create a uh, option for the user to uh, you know pick the designer who will actually deliver this particular product it will also allow them to complete their payment and then uh, book the order and at the time when you actually implement or when you actually you know click on this uh, booking the order uh, this particular flow the you know my closet flow will get uh, triggered so an example of you know how the flow was designed uh, for this uh, order design flow okay so like that when an order gets received we need to check whether the order was successfully locked in the database uh, and apart from that there are a bunch of notifications that also happens <coughs> it also sends the details of the order to the actual you know designer as well as the user and then once everything is uh, successfully logged in the system it will complete the uh, flow it will also send a notification email uh, to the uh, designer for uh, them to have an alert as to such an order has been received so that they can act upon it so once that uh, entire application was designed this is how the actual deployed applications looks like right so whatever we designed earlier on the studio page designer the landing page uh, is how uh, is this looks like so these are the 
you know, trending collections that was actually retrieved by that execution of that flow and is getting populated in the bottom half of this uh, landing page for the user to have an idea of you know what are the trending designs and then he or she can actually use this as an example can show more interest on any of these ideas and then you know generate from this particular uh, variant as well so let let us say you know you start with a clean slate and the user is trying to uh, you know uh, uh, <coughs> understand what kind of uh, fashion options are available and she types in like design me a red dress like Priyanka Chopra from Citadel, right. So once uh, the user has uh, typed such a, a descriptive text about her uh, fashion uh, requirement and then clicked on generate, the system generates this set of uh, different variations using the generative AI that we had integrated earlier in the studio platform and it creates different images uh, to showcase all these different variations of design options. Right, so now <coughs> the user can you know uh, choose a particular version and then say maybe I I'm interested in this type of design and then let me see some more variations from here. So using that, it actually generates a second set of uh, variations. So again, multiple options are available. You can continue to experiment and then see which interests you and then you can choose the particular uh, dress here. So suppose I add one to the cart, right? This one is what I like and then I added this to the cart and now I can go and then proceed to uh, you know, checking it out. <clears throat> so this is how the checkout screen looks like. So this is what I added in the cart. I have options to set my overall budget, which I'm looking for uh, to choose my designer and what kind of delivery dates that I'm looking at. And the system uses this different uh, perspectives on uh, budget, expected date, location, and understands who are the designers who are available to deliver this as per their expected timelines within their budget. So I can choose a designer and uh, choose my payment method and then I can complete the order book. Yeah, so this is a quick example of uh, how a startup used a studio platform and then went about creating this unique uh, boutique experience uh, in a fashion uh, designer in a e-commerce uh, model, but it gives them a, a very unique experience of being able for her to describe what kind of fashion requires and then um, we have a unique solution which actually generates all these uh, different styles based on generative AI technologies and not using a typical uh, you know, stored catalog of products. So everything is a unique design uh, the designer will uh, be able to create such a design which obviously gives a very unique advantage to this startup. Yeah, so overall we saw how, uh, you know, Candy helped us uh, in building a technical POCs. At the same time, moving on from a technical POC to a full-fledged uh, prototype uh, where we want to do a minimum viable product, uh, showcase it to a user, a uh, minimum lovable product, which has, you know, unique uh, features that a user would desire to experience in your, uh, you know, startup idea. You will be able to quickly build that, assemble these different components in the studio in a no-code manner. And at the same time, this is highly scalable at the same time, right? So you can actually add your own custom functions. You can add your own uh, custom uh, integrations, deploy it into a highly scalable environment. So you see a quick way to validate your idea with the actual market. Uh, that way you will have a very early feedback on how your idea is actually playing out uh, with the real users in the market. Yeah, back to you, Ashok. Uh, thank you so much, Karthik. Uh, that was uh, very insightful and, and, you know, I'm pretty sure uh, everyone kind of got a good deep perspective on how to actually build, you know, their uh, technical proof of concepts as well as, you know, how do they take their minimum viable product or, or what you'll rightly call as a minimum loud product uh, to their marketplace. So thanks, thanks so much for that. Uh, so now kind of, you know, you said uh, you had an idea, you tested with the marketplace, you kind of have created these prototypes. 
uh, of course, it cannot be in the last moment that you do customer testing, right? Uh, uh, with all digital and with all products, very important for you to do customer uh, feedback uh, throughout the journey, right? So what we essentially call and what we've actually felt is the design for customer success. So you really need to think through in terms of the customer and say, what do they want? And what do they want needs to reflect on the journey. And, and it, what is a typical SaaS journey? A typical SaaS journey from a customer adoption perspective is they see this message somewhere. So you're marketing somewhere. Uh, maybe there's a social post. There's an ad that says, you know, X provides Y value for a Z type of customer. So they see that. They should resonate saying, hey, this makes sense. You know, this is my persona. And this message, OK, I, I, I have that problem. So they recognize that. Then what happens? You ask them to click somewhere. They come to a landing page. That landing page should, again, be customized for them. I can't say, hey, customer X, solve problem Y here. And then as soon as they land, I talk about something else. Cannot happen. It has to be superbly personalized for that uh, customer persona. So they land in, and, and they see, OK, you know, this is what I thought I was going to get to. And, and yes, I came here. And I'm seeing what I heard. And, and yes, I want to try this. So there have some very nice videos that kind of show people say, you know, uh, and, and extremely important. That's a personal experience for us is don't try to make them hyper successful across all their problems. Make them super successful in the first step. So in that landing page, show them how to get a, a great first step done and then nudge them towards, you know, a, a trial. You know, trial is uh, almost omnipresent today in, in SaaS. So give them a trial within the platform. Again, it's very critical for customer success. Make sure they go to the first screen, second screen, third screen, blah, blah, blah. Whatever is required for uh, the first set of customer success needs to happen so seamlessly with zero friction. So very important. And, and uh, something like crowd testing, like I said, what did we say? We said democratized and disintermediated. So you can actually get a few thousand testers uh, on crowd testing platforms. You can actually, and again, pick them based on those personas, and they'll be able to uh, test your software, test you know uh, your value proportion, and give you feedback. So please use uh, crowd testing, and uh, very important, right? So we scale to millions on a digital platform, but please scale to thousands or tens of thousands in an analog platform. Meet customers, see them in action, get their feedback, invest in alpha uh, case studies, and invest in alpha for each persona. If you have 20 different personas who use your product. Make sure you have 20 different deep case studies, which can again be advocated to those different uh, user groups that you're targeting so that they see, OK, hey, someone did this somewhere. Wow, I, I have the same problem. Why don't I try that as well? So it kind of brings a very human element to uh, what someone would try. Uh, so that's, again, a once a point in time, right? So you will maybe have n number of releases. Maybe you'll do a n number of a point in time testing. Uh, but this beautiful digital platform also gives us a, a dynamic customer feedback. You can kind of keep watching uh, what people do on your platform. So analytics is extremely important. Uh, you, know, you have multiple tools to kind of you know, uh, put on top of your platform to kind of see you know, how customers are using it. Of course, you know, uh, comply with uh, GDPR, comply with uh, consent policies on, on how you treat your data. Uh, beyond that, you can actually create a structure both using surface level platforms as well as within your platform to kind of look at, uh, you know, from where are people coming? Are these people coming by referral? Are they coming from a social channel? Are they searching for a problem and finding you? Uh, how long do they spend? Uh, you know, when do they sign up? When do they do a trial? What did they do? And then they came back. Like, what defines a, a successful repeat usage? Same way, map the entire customer journey and, and find out you know, what happens in each step, what works, what does not work, uh, and how you can take it forward. And, and sticking to the human element, uh, invest in a community. You know, have a set of, you know, let's say you have uh, millions of users on your digital platform, invest in maybe tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people who will, who will kind of collaborate with you, who will have a two-way relationship with you, who will kind of you know, maybe vote on a feature roadmap, submit issues, give you feedback maybe attend some of your training boot camps and so on and so forth, they will give you product feedback. And as they solve problems, give them avenues to be your product champions because uh, users want to hear from users. Users would love to hear from users than trying to hear from a company that says how great their product is. So kind of use these levers wisely. 
uh, again, given these are digital products, these are fairly accessible to all of us. Uh, and, and last but not the least, I think uh, to scale significantly, you need digital marketing. Uh, this itself is a is a large topic on its own, so you know we wouldn't deep dive into all of these things. But these are some things that we found useful, uh, and you should kind of you know make sure you understand, and and based on different phases of your product maturity, market maturity, you could use all of these or some of these. So for example, searches, uh, all the search engines you can advertise. If customer has an intent that says, hey, I'm looking for a solution to a problem, then your 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 platform pops up, and then you know you can have people. Uh, with a message who could come to your platform, try it. Uh, social, like we talked about, very important. You could use a lot of creative ways as well. You could show some memes, you could show some, you know, uh, 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 softer aspects of your solution. You could maybe target very specific uh, groups, uh, interest groups that may be there in, in these platforms. Uh, look at the physical community. This is something that we have found very useful because people uh, don't want to buy a product, right? People are not seeking to buy a product. People are seeking to solve their problems, right? So instead of trying to sell a product, uh, create a community, and that community is focusing on jointly solving the problem. So spend time, uh, show your users the best way to solve that problem, and of course, you're going to solve that problem using your product. So it, it almost is advertising, but the message is very different. It is saying, hey, come, let's work together to solve the problem, rather than saying, hey, try my product, there's a 30-day trial. So. Uh, having a good community framework will take you to a absolutely different level of uh, you know building your uh, market presence. Uh, video marketing again uh, very critical these days because video is a very strong emerging mechanism today. Uh, search engine optimization as you scale, you know as your business builds, you will have a lot of content, uh, you will have a lot of solutions. So create content around it so that when people are searching for it, yeah, you don't need to kind of depend on search advertising, but naturally, organically. Uh, you know, you will be recommended by uh, some of these, you know, uh, chatbots and uh, and search engines as well. So, so that's a great summary from a digital marketing perspective, and and kind of you know, uh, uh, take a look back, and you know, we create had an idea, we elaborated that idea, we kind of got feedback from a small set of customers, we looked at an addressable market, we looked at how do we scale by you know, slotting those slices together. Uh, we created those POCs, uh, we created prototypes uh, using uh, some of the amazing technologies that Karthik showed us. Uh, and of course, uh, you're going to scale significantly through a, a cost, constant customer feedback and digital marketing. Uh, so I hope you really found this useful. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, it's been uh, an honor for me to share our learnings with all of you. Uh, thank you so much and have a, a wonderful rest of the course and wishing you all the best uh, with your startup journey. Thank you.